by death I will be still Whatever he does And follow where he guided He is my God Though dark the road He holds me that I shall not fall Wherefore to him I leave it all He holds me that I shall not Seldom do we need comfort more than when a loved one dies. And so my question was in preparing for this is how do we do that? Where do we find comfort when hearts are breaking? When someone who was so precious to his friends and family, loved ones, is gone from us. What could possibly make that okay? And I believe I have the answer from the Word of God. I'll tell you this. If you could see Mark right now, if you could see him right now, where he is, what he's doing, and who he's with, you'd be absolutely fine with him not being here. Absolutely fine. You'd still miss him, but you'd be happy. You'd be so happy for him. 
by God's grace through faith. I believe we can see that. I believe we can see where Mark is. If the Lord is pleased to meet with us today and to speak to us through his word, I believe we can see that. Let's look at verse one. I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. Now this is future for us. We're still living on the old earth. This earth is old and tired and evil. Let's just be honest. This earth is an evil place because of us. It's full of evil people. For Mark, though, there's no old heaven or earth anymore. This don't exist for him anymore. The cares of this world are a burden to believers that are here. They even, we, we read that they choke out, the cares of this world choke out the seed of God's word in the case of many, but not for Mark. He knows nothing of that now. The first creation, the one we live on, is under the curse of God because of our sin, but not the new one. He has made a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. And that's future for us, but not for him. The first creation groaneth and travaileth because of sin and rebellion and all manner of evil perpetrated by men, but not the new one. Not where Mark is. Look at verse two. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Where Mark lives now, it's pictured as a city. It's a population of people. God has populated this new heaven with a people, a people that he chose from the foundation of the world, a people that says that he's loved with an everlasting love. You look that word up in the, in the Hebrew, it means without beginning or end. His love is boundless for his people. And every citizen of that place is the chosen. Think about what a bride is. The bride, as a bride adorned for her husband. Chosen, loved from all eternity, Think about it. God said a man will leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife and they twain shall be one flesh. He chose her. He loved her. He laid hold of her. He made himself one with her. The one person out of all the earth that's for me is sitting right over there. That's who we are to Christ. Every one of us is the one person in all the earth that's his. When that says that that shepherd had a hundred sheep and he lost one of them, you know who that is? Don't worry about who the 99 are. Which one are you? That's the question. Every one of his people are that one sheep. Every one of his people are his bride, chosen, loved, joined unto all of God's sheep are that one lost one that he went and found and laid on his shoulder and brought home rejoicing, saying, come and rejoice with me. I found my sheep, which was lost. Mark was loved with an everlasting love by the Lord Jesus Christ, his husband, chosen to be always with Christ, he was provided for by Christ before he was ever born until the day he died and until this day. Protected by Christ, cherished by Christ, made one with Christ. That's where he is now, the bride. They come down from God adorned, it says. For it's God that makes us fit to be married to his son. Adorned. We have to be adorned with what? Listen to Ezekiel 16, 8. Now, when I passed by you, God says to his people, I looked upon you. Behold, your time was the time of love. And I spread my skirt over you and covered your nakedness. 
Yea, I swear unto you and entered into a covenant with you, saith the Lord God, and you became mine. Mine. And then washed I thee with water, yea, I thoroughly washed away thy blood from thee, and I anointed thee with oil. I clothed thee also with broidered work, and shod thee with badger skin, and I girded thee about with fine linen, and I covered thee with silk. I decked thee also with ornaments, and I put bracelets upon thy hands, and a chain on thy neck, and I put a jewel on thy forehead, and earrings in thine ears, and a beautiful crown upon thine head. Thus wast thou decked with gold and silver, and thy raiment was of fine linen and silk and broidered work. Thou didst eat fine flour and honey and oil, thou wast exceeding beautiful, and thou didst prosper into a kingdom, and thy renown went forth among the heathen for thy beauty. And here's what all of that represents, all those beautiful adornments. Here's what it all represents. For it was perfect. Your beauty was perfect through my comeliness. Mark is just like the Lord Jesus Christ right now. <laughs> and so he is beautiful beyond imagination. Perfect perfect, glorious. That's what this means. A bride adorned. A bride adorned by God. With what? With his glory. With his beauty. With his righteousness. With his atoning blood. White. He's washed his robe and made it white in the blood of the lamb. And then verse three, I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. And he will dwell with them and they shall be his people and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Mm. God himself. God himself will be with them. God told Moses, Moses asked the Lord, I beseech you, show me your glory. And God told Moses, you can't see me and live. So I'm just going to show you a glimpse. I'm just going to give you a glimpse of my glory. Do you remember what God said as he showed Moses his glory? In Exodus 33, 18, let me read it to you. And he said, Moses said to God, I beseech thee, show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. That's the glory of God. He saves sinners. He saves whoever he wants to save. A lot of people talk about a God that can't save you unless you let him. Saul of Tarsus didn't let him. I didn't let him. He saved me anyway. That's how he saves sinners. He saves them anyway. That's the God of this book. I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, you can't see my face for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, listen to this. Here's our Lord Jesus Christ. Behold, there is a place by me and thou shalt stand upon a rock and it shall come to pass while my glory passeth by that I will put thee in a cliff of the rock and will cover thee with my hand while I pass by. What we see of God in this life is wonderful. He sets us upon the rock of ages as he did Moses. By faith, we're set upon a rock. The Lord Jesus Christ, the one foundation other than which no man can lay. And he covers us with the right hand of his majesty. And he's gracious to us by the precious blood of his cross. And by faith in his blood from there, from Christ our Redeemer, where God put us, of God are we in Christ who has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. And from there, from the cliff of the rock, we see the very glory of God. As much as a sinner can. But then, where Mark is, 
the very glory of God face to face. Listen to the way the Apostle Paul spoke of it in 1 Corinthians 13, 11. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. That's a comparison that he's making to what? He's saying, I used to be a child. I thought like a child. I saw things a different way than I do now. When I'm a man, now I'm a man. I see things differently. I understand things better. And listen to what he's comparing that to. For now, we see through a glass darkly. Moses, you can see me, but not not my face. You can't see all of me. You can't see me as I am now. It'll kill you. I'll show you what I can. And the Lord has shown us much of what he can of his glory. Now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. That's where Mark is. Bless God, that's where Mark is. Verse four, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away. How beautiful this is. Look at this with me. When the Lord heals, when he fixes, he doesn't just treat the symptoms. He cures the cause. He doesn't just wipe tears away. He wipes death away. He doesn't just wipe the tears away. He wipes sorrow away. I could wipe your tears right now from your face. That'd be a tender gesture of love. It might mean something to you. But I can't wait, wipe away the reason you're crying. But he does. He does. He doesn't just wipe away tears. He wipes away pain for the former things. He removes all of the reasons not only the tears that you might be shedding today, but he wipes away all of the tears that we've ever shed. All of them. They may be dry now, but they still may be there. The cause, the hurt, the sorrow, the pain. He wipes away every tear we've ever shed and all of the reason for them. No more of this, what we're doing today. No more death. We will never say goodbye ever again. 1 Corinthians 15, 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed, for this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. No more death. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that ever caused us to weep is a former thing where Mark is. Verse 5, he that sat upon the throne, said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Right, for these words are true and faithful. What a blessing that the Lord told John, Write these things down. 
And now we're reading them this morning. <laughs> this is our comfort. This is the anchor for our soul. And rightly so. When we are changed and everything that's caused by our sin is gone, when he does something, when the Lord does something, it says he makes all things new. When he does it, it's all the way done. When he does it, it can't be undone. And when he does it, he gets all the glory for it. Let's give it to him. <laughs> we can't even do that without his grace, can we? We can't even glorify him unless he's gracious to us. What does new mean to us? New. He makes everything new. What does that mean? Well, here's part of it. Philippians 3.20, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We look for the one that Mark looked for and has now found eternally. We look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. And that's new. <laughs> that's new. We're not much like him now, are we? But then we will be. We'll be all the way like him. He shall change our vile body and fashion it like unto his glorious body according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Because of his power, we're going to be changed. That's where Mark is. And he said unto me, verse 6 in our text, it is done. I'm, it's not done till he says it's done. I've longed for it to be done at times. Sometimes I still do. It's not done till he says it's done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is thirsty of the fountain of the water of life freely. The history of man began in a place where one thing was forbidden. Something we didn't need. And yet we took it because we were sin waiting to happen. When it is done, we will be in a place where we're just like the Son of God, where we cannot sin, where nothing is forbidden, where we only have one need, and he's ours freely, freely. <laughs> Christ is the fountain. He's the water of life. And all of the temporal things that we thirsted for in this world, those are former things. Those are former things. We have one craving there where Mark is. In verse seven, he that overcometh shall inherit all things and I'll be his God. And he shall be my son. Maybe you're thinking, isn't he our God now? Are we not his sons, those of us who know the Lord Jesus Christ? Yeah, but here's the difference between now and then. 1 John 3, 1. Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God, Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. There's a lot we don't know. But we know that when he shall appear, we'll be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And that makes him our God and we his sons in a whole new sense. <laughs> if we're in Christ, if we've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, 
We can't be any more his than we are right now. We can't be any more his. But we can sure know it a lot better. <laughs> we can experience it much, much better than we do now. It's not so much as we look at this that Mark is in a better place. That's what people like to say. Well, they're in a better place. Our loved one's in a better place. That's really not the point. When I say where Mark is, what I really mean is who Mark is with. <laughs> Listen to Philippians 1.21 in closing. For me to live right now is Christ. Is that honestly true of you? For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Well, preacher, you say Christ is so wonderful. If, Christ, if, if what we're doing now is Christ, then how does it get better than that? More Christ. To live is Christ and to die is more Christ. More than we experience now, more than we can possibly know him now in this body of death. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I don't know. For I am in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ. That's where Mark is. He's not in a better place. <laughs> It's not about that. He's with Christ, which is far better. Amen. May God bless us today as we worship him and on this occasion and thank him for, for the time that we did have with our brother and look forward to when we'll be with him and there won't be any time. All right, I'll come on up. How tedious and tasteless the hours when Jesus no longer I see. Sweet prospects, sweet birds, and sweet flowers have all lost their sweetness to me. The midsummer sun shines but dim, the fields drive in vain to the game. But when I am happy in him, December's as pleasant as May. His name yields the richest perfume and sweeter than music his voice. His presence disperses my gloom and makes all within me rejoice. I should were he always thus not have nothing to wish or to fear. No mortal so happy as I, my summer would last all the year. Content with beholding his face, my all to his pleasure resign. No changes of season or place would make any change in my mind. With a sense of his love, a palace of toy would appear, and prisons would palaces prove if Jesus would dwell with me there. My Lord, if indeed I am thine, thou art my son and my soul. Say, why do I languish and pine? And why are my winters so long?
Oh, drive these dark clouds from the sky, thy soul cheering presence restore. Oh, take me unto thee on high, where winter and cloud.